Thanks. Excellent afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another Kent seminar here at University of Illinois. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today Professor Davide Lopresti from University of Palermo. Professor Lopresti is an expert in sustainable engineering with a focus on infrastructure development and asset management. He has done research both on a fundamental and applied level for introducing life cycle thinking for existing infrastructure and the future ones. He is an associate professor and the head of the Smarty Lab at the University of Palermo. And today he is going to present us the Smarty Lab, the sustainable multifunctional automated resilient transportation infrastructure lab at the university he's working at. So welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Professor Lopresti to the seminar. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And even though it's a little bit late here, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I will make, have my dinner after. <laughs> uh, just before I start, if, just to check, can you hear me well? Yes. 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 Okay, perfect. Right, so I'm going to share my presentation, and uh, if you can also confirm that you can see my screen, that would be great. Yes, we can see it, Professor. Perfect. 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 Okay. So, again, it was a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been in Urbana-Champagne already, but... I would have loved to come again, but thanks God there is also internet and we can continue working while staying in touch. So I'm here today, guys. Um, well, let me say actually, why am I here uh, to start with? I think it's actually something that people might, might ask themselves. Uh, I know that the audience is mainly made of graduates, but also researcher, also, also some, some colleagues from academia. But I just would like to share that uh, after my PhD, actually during my PhD, I had the chance to join the University of Nottingham. And I was supposed to stay there for 18 months, working basically here on material technologies, not sure if you see it. Material technologies working with recycling. So I was more sustainability in design and performance. But then I started getting into research, got some project, and I ended up staying 10 years. And where this allowed me basically to cover all this map. And then I had the opportunity to actually come back home because I'm from Italy, I'm from Sicily, from Palermo. And after 10 years in 2019, I actually got the opportunity to come back in Italy through a fellowship from the government. Basically stay in a warmer place, thinking of what some might call smart materials of payment infrastructure. And that's where the smart lab then came, actually happened. But we'll we'll talk about it a little bit later. Let me start by actually asking you, even though it's difficult to have reply. So I usually ask, what do you think is a smart transport infrastructure? Anyone has an idea? I can see some people here. Anyone wants to give a shout? There are no wrong answer. Okay, just just try. I, I think give a shot. Yeah, yeah, go on. Go ahead. Speak. Is it, is it infrastructure that is instrumented and can communicate with the people magic and so that you can optimize right. things, as well as say and that kind of uh, thinking? Okay. So communication, intelligence, no, and you can communicate. Yes. Great. Anyone else? Any other idea? Don't be shy, guys. No. People prefer to drink their, their Coke. 
<laughs> it's okay, guys. Hopefully, I'll give you some hints. So I ask myself the same question, and I keep asking people around the planet, but basically, someone that started talking about it was 2012 in the UK, where the Royal Academy of Engineering basically defines smart infrastructure as an infrastructure that responds intelligently no? to changes in its environment. And basically, as your colleague was saying, is able to collect data, analyze them, and then provide a feedback. But then where the real intelligence comes from is that this infrastructure with time can adapt itself based on this feedback and the data analyzed in time. So really the idea was to provide a brain, right? To the, to the infrastructure so that, that it could adapt itself based on, on, on this data. This is great. This is what I, we think was a very good starting point, but you know, Smart, it's definitely intelligent, but if you look in the dictionary, you can actually go and find also that the smart is a smart move, right? It's a good decision and something wise. And certainly if we want to get the data, communicate, get the infrastructure to adapt, we should provide some intelligence. But in our times, there are, I would say, even bigger problems. Because the infrastructure is deteriorating fast, no? but we also have increasing demands. And yes, we can collect data and let the infrastructure adapt for that. But we also have shrinking budgets. We have increasing expectation from everyone. Then there is climate change. And odds are to come not only for climate change, but actually also from us, you know, in amazing traffic, which is keep on increasing. And then in Europe, for instance, we have the European Green Deal that say, oh, you have to de decarbonize your infrastructure. And we're talking about sustainability since a long while, but how we actually implement it. Other people want equity, no? We want that everyone in the, in the right level of accessibility can, can use the infrastructure. And of course, this to be safe. So what I'm trying to say is that certainly intelligence is something that may help us, but possibly we need something that is a little bit wider, more complex. And that's why we thought about Smarty as a transport infrastructure system that is designed, constructed, and managed by integrated smart solutions that are not necessarily intelligence, but actually are the, no, are the good decision, are the wise and elegant solution that will allow infrastructure to cope and adapt to the main challenges of our time. And to do that, we created a vision, also some principles to implement it, and we'll talk today about this together with some prototypes and some roadmaps that we think are the, you know, the guide that provides some key steps to arrive to smart. This was such a big vision that we needed to have a group of people. And that's where Smarty European Training Network came from. We first developed the vision and then we thought, okay, this is, we need a platform where we can talk. And we can talk while growing people. Because the people that will hear us and will talk with us, they will then bring Smarty to, 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 to possibly make it reality. And so we play with the words by actually making a vision where smart transport infrastructure is something, is an infrastructure that actually has four features. S stands for sustainable. And as you can see here is something that for us maximize recycling and minimize the emissions, but we'll talk about it later. The M stands for multifunctional, not for transport only. The A for automated, which is more or less that intelligence we were talking about before. And R for resilient. So these four 
plus Strassman infrastructure is what we define as smarty. So how we can arrive to smart? Well, we put together many people. This is, was a four year project that was more than 4 million euros back and allow us to create a program which is called research through training or better training through research. And what we decided to do is to basically wanted to have a multidisciplinary group with academia, industry, and 15 researchers, we'll see it later, that will allow us to find this elegant solution at any level of the transport infrastructure engineer ecosystem. We should find solution not only for the materials, but we should include solution at different level. You need to find your solution to, to maximize recycle for your asphalt mixture, but at the same time, you should also think okay, how can it be sustainable at a road payment level, at an infrastructure network level, and then also the bigger network. And the same for the other feature. Another support was that in order to help with the implementation of this innovation, we needed to reason by following the technology readiness level, which I'm pretty sure you know, guys, but in Europe is not that common. But can you confirm me that you know what I'm talking about in the States? Yes. Good. Uh, it comes from NASA, but this is a real good support to think about implementing innovation. And with Smarty, we really were uh, at between zero and four, okay? So we are very much in this area where, you see, it's where academia, and some businesses are involved uh, to do basic research and start to understand how to apply it. Then we go to higher stage where actually it's possibly the private sector that should help more in implementing. So with this idea, Mian, we put together basically, and we ended up with more than 30 partners, guys, but the idea was to put together all the stakeholders of the transport infrastructure, from design to material, and then construction, material supply, construction, management, and also those experts in what we call smartening of transport infrastructures. We will see better in details later on. But, and that was the idea. So putting together these people and growing 15 researchers, that could develop components of roads, railways, and airports, and uh, ended up with creating what we call prototypes and guidelines to arrive at Smarty. Now, you will find all these guys in our smartetn.eu website. It's all free of charge. You can all access to it. I strongly suggest you to go and see what we suggest some idea of the prototypes that today I'm going to show you, but also the guidelines now to arrive to this smart team because guys, okay, smart is a vision. It's an idea. We started and implemented it, but really people like you can actually make it happen. So go there and, and take this idea to possibly making them happen. What we did as well, but I go fast here, is to actually train people on what is sustainability, multifunctionality, automation and resilience of transport infrastructure in different parts of the world. You can see Italy, France, Spain. We also went in Australia and ended up with this 15 fellows that now you can find. You can find all of them in the website. So if you want to contact them, there are all the contacts there. But let me go and show you a little bit of what we did. Let's start with the prototypes. First of all, for us, a sustainable transport infrastructure was it's a, an infrastructure that is designed to last by maximizing recycling and minimizing the impact. This can be done at the technology development level. And basically, our idea is that we should try any promising technology by increasing recycling no, of secondary material or reuse of asphalt mixture, 
doing what we know how to do in the labs, testing, modeling. But at the same time, we need to, to understand whether maximize recycling or whatever promising technology you want to use, it is actually minimizing this impact. We need to the go alongside technology development. And that's where we started tailoring life cycle analysis tool, like environmental CA, life cycle costing. And now also we are really much working on social life cycle analysis. This is something that is happening in Europe and in the smart lab in particular. And this happens at the technology level, but also an asset management level. In other words, what a um, road authority or designer usually do is to design a road, possibly, possibly predict their performance, and then also have a maintenance strategy that look at the life cycle. This is what we hopefully do in a road authority. But honestly, what we should do is that we should look at different scenarios and not only check a performance in terms of mechanical performance, you know, but we also should look at sustainability performance based on indicators that look at the environmental impact, the economical impact, and the social impact. And that's where sustainability assessment should help whoever manages roads to arrive to more sustainable decision making. Well, in this sense, guys, this is, you know, some suggestion on the side, collateral. I strongly suggest you know, look what we did in Payment LCM, which is a project that we did for the Conference of European Road Director, which is a, a basically the equivalent of FHWA for the States. And here we define what is sustainability assessment, how you perform it, they give a package to implement it in what we call national road authority. It's for major national road authority. And you can find different, all the, 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 the results in, in a, this package, you will find it on the website. And there are also a series of technical briefs that might be useful for you guys to understand a little bit more what is sustainability assessment and how we can communicate it to road authorities. I'll strongly suggest it to go. And if if you can't find, can't download it, just send me an email because I probably have to offer you. But please go there. Um, other thing that we do is that we try to change this technique to do sustainability assessment for tailoring to our sector, well, I told you about social CA, but we are also trying to include, you know, to, to account for circular economy, so to account on how circular is a product by coupling life cycle assessment and circular economy. This is what cost us this within Smarty. So these are something of some of the prototypes we uh, developed within the sustainable transport infrastructure pillar but we also work on a roadmap. And this is something that really I, I strongly suggest to go and look, guys. This was came from a thinking process of four years. And what we think we should do to arrive to more sustainable transport infrastructure is to realize what is our current situation in terms of our goals, which is maximizing recycling, minimizing the impact and design and manage to, to last and going through our stepping stones. Just to give an example, to maximize recycling, our vision is that we should arrive to any specification where we don't talk about maximizing recycling. We talk about limiting the amount of virgin materials. Maximizing recycling should be the standard. Secret systems should be the standard. And we should have skilled local management that actually takes, uh, you know, exploit effective exploitation of land and natural resources uh, doesn't, does happens. And, and so we can ensure a more sustainable use of these resources. I'm not reading the whole, the whole roadmap guys, you have for the sake of time, please go and you will find them in the guidelines.
Multifunctional transport infrastructure. This was another pillar that we tried to develop, but the main idea here is that we want to optimize the use of this planet Earth. And transport infrastructure roads, but linear transport infrastructure in general, if you look at from the moon, they occupy the biggest slice of the planet Earth more than any other uh, piece of infrastructure made from humans. So we actually occupy a lot of planet Earth just for transport. So the idea is why don't we take this land occupy just for transport and maybe use this infrastructure for something else. They're part of the ecosystem and maybe we can use for creating energy. And that's where the main efforts of the project went. Some people even want to use this network of infrastructure to monitor the planet Earth. <laughs> I'm not going into that. I just give you some of the example to actually create energy from this infrastructure. One of the idea was to create a sandwich of um, it's a, it's a product that possibly uh, would create energy from the sun, okay, by using a road pavement that has an asphalt mixture, which is a porous asphalt, and over this asphalt mixture you put a kind of chip, no, um, and flexible solar panel, solar cells, and over that there is what is then became a microsurface made of glass coming from parfum bottles and a transparent resin that will ensure the friction. And from the research made by Domenico, ensure to have an efficiency of the solar cell that arrived up to 70%. So, of course, you know, with also the use of this microsurface, uh, you don't have the, the, the highest efficiency possible, but, but apparently we arrive to manage to keep the 70% of the, of the efficiency. But also there is a base layer that would allow, uh, or better, there is this porous asphalt that would allow a circulation of water. So usually the idea is to put it in a place where you actually have the possibility of put more water through this porous concrete layer that will help refreshing no? the solar panel and uh, at the same time taking the water that is warmed up and use it for, again, energy harvesting. I strongly suggest you to go and see in the prototypes what Domenico did. Um, I go directly to what Maria did, which is another way to get her to harvest energy. But this time, we basically want to harvest energy to uh, give energy to sensors, all right? And that's what Maria did with some piezoelectric sensor that are made to monitor the road pavement. This was another project, and I strongly suggest you to go and look. But then we arrive to a roadmap. There are other projects, guys, but I really, I can't talk about them all. I will talk a little bit more about automated. But for the more multifunctional, you'll find this roadmap. And again, you will see uh, that we give some advice on how to conceive the infrastructure beyond transport and how to optimize loose also for a very energy integrated transport infrastructure system. Automated. This is where usually, you know, people like to talk more, but I can see that I'm already taking a lot of time. So I go a little bit faster. Uh, automated is a quick sensor to allow proactive communication with managers and users. We have several projects with different sensors, but the idea was to embed sensors in a payment. Okay. So to improve design, improve predictive maintenance, and improve asset management at the end. There are other ways to get data, guys, and this comes from vehicles, from cars. But here, we 
investigate an embedded technology. And let me talk you about one in particular. This was a project made in Nottingham um, with also the collaboration of Michigan State University. And basically, the idea is that we can implement this in, in big scale. So we needed a, a sensor that was low cost, small size, that had no battery, that is easy to maintain, that also have a good data analysis because we can get all this big data and understanding how to use it. It's, it, I mean, of course we have to do it, but it's a lot of effort. So we also have to think on how to analyze this data and can be used, can be easy to install and also used for several applications. So we actually um, used a sensor made by Michigan State, which is called self power wireless PAs or floating gate sensor, that basically uh, has the great idea that the sensor is the piezoelectric membrane itself. So we protect the membrane, we connect it to a wireless battery and to some uh, data storage. But basically the piezoelectric membrane, when it has an impulse, it creates some energy, and this energy is used to actually power the system that is going to store information that we can retrieve later. So basically, whenever the car passes by, you do see that we record impulse and we record different level of impulse and I'm not going too much in detail, but we have basically seven levels, okay, that we are able then to um, recognize and basically retrieve information about all the seven levels so that we know which type of impulse we had that of course are related to the different loading and different events that occur on the pavement. I can answer question about it later on, but now I wanted to show you that basically we have been given this membrane and that give us electrical impulse, but what really what we wanted to understand is how this compared for instance to strain. So we calibrated these sensors in a four point bending test. We obtained very, very good results. So basically the voltage are giving somehow giving a strain. But what we discover with the time is that you can actually calibrate this voltage with many things. With weights, with load, with acceleration. This is really uh, something that Professor Langeneth, Nathan Langeneth from Michigan State, which we collaborate quite closely, can, can, can explain it better. But I just wanted to show you that we actually apply this to an APT. And APT is an asphalt payment testing. We we apply this within a project and we compare them with also with other um, strain gauges that are usually used in a uh, in this type of um, uh, experiment. What we realize and follow me here, guys, is that basically this was this is a carousel. It's an APT in France. We could apply load circularly. Okay. The experiment is usually one year because you have to get the, the winter and the summer and you can change load. Now, we install different mixture in five sections. Okay, guys. And just following with this, what we did is that every month, for instance, or in different weeks, you go and check the cracks. And visually, you sign with a pen with different colors the amount of cracks that appear in a different period. So blue is the first month, red is the second month, and so on, okay? You do it for different mixture, and basically, visually, we obtain that the mixture we installed, I'm not going into the detail, but these were mixture made with up to 50% recombinant asphalt, and there were no bitumen is with a binder completely based with, uh, made with biomass. But 
that's another story. What I wanted to show you here, guys, is that in this experiment, we saw that visually, after 900,000 no, steps, 900 passes of the wheel, we could see an amount of cracks that for, for us, it's, uh, you know, signifies failure, okay? Remember this number, 900,000. But then we started looking at what we had from the sensors, the piece of uh, floating gate sensors. And you can see guys, 900,000 is here, where all the gates of the sensor are open. But basically what we realized from the data is that a much less repetition, so a much lower number of passes, we actually see some, some results. And possibly what we think is that we're starting to identify with this sensor that we have a no damage zone, but we can start seeing also the crack formation zone, the crack pro propagation up to the surface cracks. But surface cracks is really when we don't want water run. We want to predict the crack propagation, the crack formation, all right? So this tool may be used in the future, that's our belief, our strong belief, to actually predict cracks and not just see them on the surface. Okay, just checking the time, guys. Uh, five minutes. So, thanks to that and discussion around this topic, we also developed a roadmap on automated transport infrastructure that will allow proactive communication and more intuitive use from user, but also simplified asset management. Again. Go there if you're if you're curious. And we also try and look at resilient transport infrastructure. What are resilient for us? Well, it's any infrastructure that adaptable to changes, okay? But also conceived to, for instance, self-repair. Very quickly, what is resilience? It's the capacity of a system to recover from, from any difficulties, okay? So basically, if you have a risk, and you don't arrive to a point no return, this is thanks to preventive measures that you can implement. But if the point of no return is passed, well, you still want to engineer some solution that are some mitigation strategies. This is for us was how we define resilience. And these are some of the solutions we suggested. First of all, some selfing in asphalt. By introducing some capsule with sunflower oils, Ignacio could show that actually we could promote cell feelings, at least in micro cracks, and 80% of the original stiffness was recovered. Now, be careful, guys. This is for micro cracks, okay? Not macro. It's really for micro cracks. And this type of capsule could help, possibly retarding, no? The formation of micro. Big cracks. The other point was to use magnetic particles within the mixture, so the through magnetic field that were excited, for instance, from an external magnet, we could have what is called here mechanomutable asphalt. This was developed in Granada. Paulina worked on it and had a different application. We, for instance, could play with these particles to increase the stiffness of the modulus of the sorry the stiffness of the pavement whenever we need or we can use it to for maintenance application to the ice because we could increase the temperature or we can even use to create a coding that could be used to communicate for instance with uh, with vehicles no with connected autonomous bikes just to give you an example of this, uh, they developed um, an application for the mobile phone to put on a scooter that could actually talk with the pavement. So check this out, guys. This, right, this trip as, uh, is, was implemented with the, with the mom. And here, this is the phone. When the scooter passed, Basically, you see this became red because the pavement actually communicate with the scooter and automatically 
reduce the speed. Now, this could have some safety issue, but it's well engineered. It could, for instance, be used in cities to not only alert for reduction of the speed reduction, but actually to possibly, <laughs> if you go too fast, to um, proactively lower the speed of scooters. This was another solution. This is the other roadmap, guys. But let me write a conclusion because time is running. And smart solution for us, no. Uh, we could write to Smarty by acquiring multidisciplinary competencies. This was very important because in this path, we have to learn to work with mechanical engineer, with the electrical engineer, but also with the architects, with experts in sustainability. This is important because education leads to cultural change. The only way we arrive to this type of goals is through cultural change, but this is a slow process. We have to educate ourselves first and educate the new generation like you guys. You have to do this, implement smart solution at a different levels, technology readiness level helps, and an integrated approach is fundamental. Now, we also developed a roadmap for developing countries, but this is for another story. Before I finish, I really want to acknowledge whoever worked in this project, really, guys, so many people. You go and check the website for the details. But before leaving you, if you allow me, I would like to spend two minutes to show you what we're actually doing, because Smart TTN actually was the idea behind Smarty Lab. Smarty Lab, it's the lab that I had the chance to lead here, where we engineer smart solution for sustainable infrastructure. We have now a group, but also these are my stricter collaborators, but there are many, well, at least now four graduate students working with us. What we really do is engineer sustainability in each phase of the life cycle of the trust infrastructure. And really what we do is we try to implement in Smarty. This comes from several projects we did in the past. I'm not going to bother you, but basically you can find all this in our smartylab.unipa.it if you're interested. And really this will give you different ideas of what we mean with engineering sustainability. Uh, this was done through also two very big projects like Super ATN and Smart ATN. Please guys go there and check. But what I wanted to show you is just to give you some other idea as uh, the project we are working on now. Rumber Up is about to finish and basically we are investigating whether we can recycle rubberized asphalt. And to do that, we are first of all working with road authorities to implement it here and in Italy, in Sicily. And in order to do that, we actually looked at the long-term aging of this re-recycled rubberized asphalt and see whether it comply at least with Italian road authorities. And then we started implementing this type of technology by using a technology which is called engineer crumb rubber. Guys, this actually is an American technology, but that we are using uh, in Europe also thanks to the support of high recycling solution from the Switzerland. If you want to know more guys, you will see in a website, but I strongly suggest to look at this paper to see how this product really works. It really works. I strongly suggest to go there. Uh, another one, just to give you a hint, possibly not supposed to talk about this because it's, it's, it's about to start, but one of the new question about implementing rubberized asphalt is whether it actually produces other microplastics than then through water, you no know, rain, it goes into in our seeds. And so rubber free will look with a medium consortium of but really international, we look on assessing whether the microplastic produced by different type of asphalt, not only rubberized, it's actually comparable with what is called 
tie road wear particles, which is produced in road by the, the, the wearing of the tire. If you want to know more, again, check the website. And I want to leave you guys with the last ideas that I hope is really the last, okay? And this is done within a big center in Italy for sustainable mobility. But I just wanted to think a little bit with you guys. You possibly know what is the International Roughness Index, okay? This is used for maintenance, no? Um, really internationally. And this comes usually from uh, by looking at our road with uh, some multifunctional vehicle, very expensive vehicle. We look with laser, we look with profilometer, and then we have an idea of the roughness of our road. But how about if this roughness is measured not by this expensive vehicle, but by our cars? And how about if I can tell if I tell you that we can actually take so many data from our cars that now we can create quality maps of our road surface on the urban area. And how about I tell you that it's already a couple of years that this has happened so that we can actually see the trend and possibly also set some alerts and see what happened in the, in the road to actually prioritize our maintenance strategy. And see, this is my city, guys. This is Palermo. And see where actually are the point where we should do maintenance so that we can tell our governors how to optimize these strategies. Well, guys, this is happening and it's going to happen at least in the next couple of years. But stay tuned. And all this, we teach them. I had the pleasure to teach them in a civil engineering course here in Palermo, in two courses, which is smart roads, airports, railways, but also a new course, which is called Sustainable Transport Infrastructure. It's all in English. And let me also give you with great pleasure the first time we talk about it, but from 2025 to 2026, there will be a European Joint Master dedicated to sustainable and resilient payment engineers, which will be coordinated by the University of Antwerp in Belgium, but they'll see also Palermo in Italy, University of Milan in Portugal, and Technology University of Manipal in India. And there will be a two years program that will form professional sustainable resilient payment. This is really all. Uh, <laughs> let me give you a last call for papers for a conference that you will know because Imal Kadi. It's, it's there as well, but there's also another workshop about biomaterials and pavement that is going to be in Brazil next year. If you're interested, news are going to pop up very soon. That's really it. Thanks, guys, for attention. Sorry if I took five minutes more, I guess. These are my contacts, and uh, please feel free to ask any questions. Do we have any questions in the room? Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, it's always uh, interesting for me to hear about the strategic visions for more sustainable infrastructure. Uh, there's this one thing that I've, I thought about a lot throughout your presentation, which is like there are certain fundamental building blocks towards this vision, right? Like there's a materials aspect for pavements, there's a maintenance and performance prediction aspect, there's sustainability, there's decisions, whatever. And all these are powered by research, possibly on small scale or larger scale, like some of the examples you showed. And we're trying to translate that to large scale or network level applications, right? So how do you, how do you reconcile between these two different realms? Because like, you need like a bridge or a vehicle to go from this area of small research to a larger, more scalable version, like, right? You need a set of, uh, like, you need an objective function. Like you mentioned, you have to optimize it. So there has to be like a systematic way to choose how to optimize whatever you're trying to do, right? So I'm wondering if this is something that you are working on or thinking of, or how, how is this happening with this strategic vision? Let me 
see if I understood well the question. Are you talking about sustainability assessment or in general about implementing sustainability at a different level, so project level, network level? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about how to go from very small scale project level to a network level management. How, how do you bridge that gap? That's a very good question. So to answer to that, uh, sorry if I have a little bit long, but I'll tell a little bit of my story. Because I started with my PhD with the modifying binder with tie rubber. And I started seeing that worked, went to mixture, when, you know, I went around and say, guys, this, this technology works, why wouldn't we implement it? And then I started talking with the tie recycling association that was in the UK. And they supported this. So we started making tables. And there was the Mineral Product Association, uh, the Shell, and uh, whoever was working in that industry. And basically, they started saying, yeah, you're right, works. But where are the incentives for us? Why we should implement it and change our culture if there is no incentives? That's where I changed my perspective. What I mean is that we certainly need to do research and develop skills by staying in great places like the one you are, guys. Really, you're very likely to stay there. But at the same time, you can't stop talking with the, 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 the remaining part of the world. So road authority, for the network level, going back to your question, are a really important actor. And as a researcher, you should go and talk to them. Ask them what are their doubts. Ask them how you can help them doing that steps. And once you have this relation, you will see that you will start transferring that knowledge that you are touching with your hands in your research. And that's where things start to happen. Also at the network level. At the, so it's not just our research and the case study and the test section. Actually things start to happen because there is a cultural change through good relation. Yes. Reputation and good relation, it's, it's a must in any part of the world. And it's a key, uh, key, step to implement what we do. I don't know it's what you're expecting for, but this is certainly my experience. Thank you. Oh, Professor. Thank you, David Day, for being with us today. Really appreciate yeah, your no. talk. <laughs> really appreciate your talk. I have a quick question for you. Uh, can you please elaborate a little bit about the strain uh, measurements and its relationship to detecting the cracks? You showed a very nice figure yes. showing the, the strain gauge propagation in the measurements and related that to the initiation of, of the cracks. Yeah, let me share the screen, Ima. So I go directly to slide uh, go the other one can you see it there is another one where you show but that's this will do because you start putting the cracks uh the initiation of the cracks and uh, you mean maybe you mean this one at the end this one here yes this one absolutely yes Okay, so this is still a black box, you know, as you probably, yeah. But basically, uh, our idea is that I mean, at the moment you see the cracks now in the surface, then we can do it visually. But if we starting gathering data at an earlier stage, as we are able to do now and start interpreting these results and possibly go in our lab and do 
specific test section, for instance, we can uh, design a payment and text section to uh, make it fail before, no? With a lower modulus or thinner. Uh, I think we can start finding that relation between this, here is cumulative voltage time, and the actual formation of the crack or crack propagation. Uh, really, we still don't have a solution if it is what we are asking, but I cannot, cannot see that this as a black box that needs to go and, and actually analyze better. Because these are basically the differing gate of the, the sensor NISA. So here we have just, it's possible your question was uh, uh, commenting better this graph. Here, all the gates are open, meaning that there are electrons in each of the gates. So we we have such a, a, a big amount of strain that possibly there are cracks in the surface. But here, not all the gates are open, just few of them. This meaning that there is some strain due to some crack, but probably is more related to the formation and propagation. But if this exact point now is just a guess, okay? These this are just to, to show you that this is what we think is, is the future. Yeah, I understand. I mean, you are just presenting the conceptual idea, which will be ultimately looking at each binder by itself and then the impact of the aging on, on that binder and calibrate accordingly, right? And I mean, this is this is mixture, if you... Yeah, this yeah, is... of course. I'm talking about mixture, but I'm saying the binder of the mixture. Okay, okay, yes, yes, exactly. So somehow by installing this this type of sensor in the pavement and analyzing them better. Really, we've been thinking about it, but then I we stopped for a while. I, I think we should come back to this. But I do think this has a great potential because we need need to go and, and get the crack while it's forming. And this type of tool give some 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 idea but we we'll still don't know how to interpret it perfectly thanks and hope next time we'll have you here in champagne <laughs> i hope so i hope so yes thanks him oh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Professor Lopresti. I think we're out of time. So if anybody has any other questions, they have your contact information. And it's fantastic to see all the results there across the pond. Uh, we will hope to talk to you soon. And uh, I think that's it for our CAN seminar this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Imal. Thank you, everyone. It's been a, a great pleasure. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.